Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my channel if this is your first time here. My name is Megan and I am the witch here around the cauldron. Today's video is a collaboration between myself and several other witchy creators here on YouTube. I can't remember who all is participating in this collaboration because there are so many of us. I will also tag everyone that participates in the description. We also have a hashtag that we're using for this collaboration and it is hashtag Thinktober. Now you might be wondering, Thinktober, what is Thinktober? And we all came together and decided that it would be a good idea for each of us to give our perspectives on the idea of critical thinking within witchcraft and paganism. So sit down, grab a cup of coffee, uh, listen because I'm not sure what sort of visual appeal this video is going to have, and let's talk about my perspective on critical thinking and witchcraft. So I'm going to be approaching this topic as a community leader, as a witch, as a pagan, as a kind of teacher or mentor. I haven't really taken on that title for myself and I don't take on um, individual students per se, but I am, I guess, in an active educational role with my responsibility as a community leader. And, you know, I make videos here on YouTube and podcasts and I have a whole website where I talk about witchcraft and paganism from my perspective and give advice and tips. So all of these different hats that I wear um, give me, I think, a unique perspective on the approach of critical thinking in witchcraft. Now I want to explain really quick what I mean when I say community leader because I don't have a coven I don't consider myself like a leader of my community on YouTube and the forum and all of that. I am an active participant. I mean, yes, I am the creator of all of it, but I didn't take on a role as a leader in that regard, more of just a let's get everybody together, hang out and share a space where we can talk about our practices and whatnot. People can ask questions and I can answer them, but so can anyone else. What I mean as a community leader is that it's kind of my job. Um, I am a community leader for Spells 8 and I'm also a writer and an editor for Spells 8 and I do a lot of different stuff over there. But one of my main responsibilities is to be a leader in the community there, on the forum there. I am responsible for answering a lot of questions over there, pointing people in the right direction when they have questions and I don't know the answer. I am responsible for helping come up with ideas for different topics and posts and different things that we can write about, pointing out issues or concerns when it comes to things like uh, misappropriation or um, the damage that can be done when we, um, as a community, don't encourage people to research the herbs and things that they're using either on themselves or ingesting. And that's like, that's kind of my job. I love it, I enjoy it. It is something that I would do even if I didn't get paid, um, but I do get paid, so that's a bonus. So a lot of my perspective on critical thinking in witchcraft is gonna come from my own personal experience, but also my experience in this position of leadership. And I think, I don't know, like, I've seen a lot and um, some of it is not so good and some of it is interesting, and, but the majority of it is like perfectly fine. So I wanna make it very, very clear that this video is not meant to point fingers at anyone. It's not meant to make anyone feel like they are bad or wrong in any sort of way. This video is simply me offering my perspective on how we can do ourselves a disservice when we're practicing witchcraft or researching when we're not using our critical thinking skills. And this this kind of thing has happened to me before too, where I get so into what I'm doing and then I, I second guess myself and I'm like, oh crap, what is this thing that I'm doing? Like, am I, am I doing it wrong? Can I actually do this? And I have to remind myself like, I can think for myself, you know? I can figure this out on my own or research, uh, from reliable sources where I could find the answer. And if I can't find the answer, then I will go to my community and I will ask for help. I also wanna make it very clear that this video is not a criticism of anyone that struggles through, you know, whatever it is that 
can make critical thinking comprehension or asking questions or anything like that an issue. Personally, I have really bad anxiety and I've also been diagnosed with ADHD and sometimes like my comprehension isn't the greatest. And that's not, in, that's not what I'm talking about in this video. I don't want anybody to feel like if you have some sort of limitation or disability that makes comprehension or critical thinking or asking questions or whatever hard for you, this that's not the topic of this video. And so I want to be very clear that this video is not meant to be a judgment on anybody. And again, it's just me offering my perspective. And if you can't tell, I'm really worried about people taking this the wrong way. So please understand that I'm coming from a place of compassion and guidance as someone who has been online for a while and has seen a lot of stuff. The main thing that I wanna talk about in regard to critical thinking is learning how to think for yourself. Critical thinking involves thinking deeply and rationally and emotionally and seeing things from multiple perspectives when it comes to researching or whatever you're experiencing. A lot of people are really good at critical thinking, but some people aren't. And then some people are like me where we second guess ourselves and then it's like our ability to think critically just flies out the window. And so this is a skill I've really had to work on myself where I'm not immediately running to someone else for answers. I am sitting with myself and thinking through the process to get like the wheels moving in my brain, right? To get to the answer that I need or the solution that I need or to finally say like, I don't know what the hell it is that I'm doing or I don't know what the answer is, I need help. When it comes to critical thinking, the main thing that I'm gonna be talking about is learning how to think for yourself because that's extremely important. Sometimes the questions that I see online make me think that no thought was put behind the question. And these are questions such as, how do I need to organize my book of shadows? Or I don't have a pillar candle, can I use a tea light candle? And, and different things like that. For people that don't know any better, these might seem like very valid questions. But when it comes down to it, when those questions have some thought behind them, or um, like some research done on your own before going to someone and asking questions, you can most likely find the answer on your own. And sometimes I think this is done because people, I mean, I have a really cynical view of humanity in general from my times working in customer service. Like you would not believe some of the things that I have seen. I mean, if you've worked in customer service, maybe you would. But sometimes I feel like when people ask questions like this, they just wanna be given the answer and told what to do. And that is completely counterintuitive to a witchcraft practice, in my opinion. Witchcraft in general, outside of any sort of tradition or coven structure or anything like that, is, in my experience, an intuitive-based practice. You have the things that you learn. Of course, you learn how to do those things, but a lot of it involves emotion and energy and feeling how things work for you. And so when you ask questions without putting any of your own thought behind it, you're really doing yourself a disservice. I also think that people ask questions like this because they're afraid of doing it wrong. And I'm not sure if this is a carryover from religious trauma or some other particular faith that they've converted from. They don't wanna do it wrong. They don't want to anger the gods or they don't wanna have a spell backfire on them or anything like that. And I think the fear is unwarranted. The only spell that I can think of that I would consider not even a backfire because it did exactly what I asked for, just not exactly what I wanted. And that was my fault for not being specific enough. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. We were going through some hard times financially and I did a spell for uh, wealth and abundance. You know, we needed more money but I didn't specify how I wanted that money to come in. And then my fiance ended up working like two or three weeks straight, long hours, long days. We ended up, you know, not struggling after that, but also that's not what I wanted to happen because he was exhausted and it was terrible and I would never do it again. Uh, being specific is very important in your spell work. But like, 
I think there's a lot of emphasis in some groups on spells backfiring or don't do this because it goes against the threefold law or, uh, you know, what you put out is going to come back to you times three. And I feel like there's, there's a lot of fear when it comes to beginners, especially wanting to practice witchcraft. They want to do it, but they're afraid that they're going to mess up or they're going to, you know, get something wrong or it's going to come back on them in a way they don't want. When we live in fear and when we practice in fear, there's no room for growth. Our fear holds us back. And when it comes to something like witchcraft where practice and repetition and, you know, actually doing the witchcraft, if you don't, if you don't do it, you're not going to grow and you're not going to get better. You can learn all of the things and you can be a theoretical witch and you can know all of the theory, but until you actually put it into practice, that theory is only half the battle. Like you can pass med school and you can have all of the book knowledge and you can have all of your facts memorized, but that's only half the battle of being a doctor. You actually have to practice medicine and you have to be okay putting that knowledge to work. You know, I think it's sort of the same thing when it comes to witchcraft. And if you don't go seek out answers for yourself, if you don't try to research and answer these questions through books or websites or podcasts or whatever, you're also not allowing yourself to grow because you're going to constantly be asking for the answers when you could figure out how to find them on your own. Of course, some questions you're going to need help with. That's normal. And I'm not saying don't ask questions. I'm saying that it's better to think about these questions first before you ask them. Come up with an idea of the answer on your own first before you go to other people and ask for their opinion, perspective, or education. And I don't want this to come off as um, patronizing, but this is a lesson that I teach my child in regards to absolutely anything. And it's something that I think if adults were taught how to do more, then people would be a lot happier and there might be a lot less conflict in the world. I don't know, maybe that's just my wishful thinking side instead of my cynical side. But I teach my child that if she's doing something for the first time or the second time, as long as it's not dangerous, she should try it for herself first and then ask for help. Now, obviously this isn't going to work if she doesn't understand the concepts. So understanding the concepts is also important, but putting forth the effort on your own first before asking for help or before seeking out the answers from someone else is really important and it allows you to grow both in your knowledge, in your practice, and even in your confidence because you may do it right. You may be great at it the first, the first time you do it. You might not, that's okay too, but that also helps build your confidence and uh, your stamina, for lack of a better word, because you have to keep going and you have to keep practicing and you're not always going to get things right. That's, that's okay. Something I also notice a lot as a community leader is people coming and asking for exact step-by-step -step instructions on how to do something and not necessarily um, wanting to know the reason things are done. They just want to know exactly how you do it. And knowing how to do something and knowing all of those steps is great, but I think it's really important to understand why you do something because that gives you a deeper understanding of what you're doing and can help you connect better. And especially if you're doing a spell or you're trying to put a ritual together, you can use the framework of someone else's ritual, but it's really important to understand why those steps are done in that order and why those steps are done at all. Why is the circle cast? Why do you use mugwort instead of lavender? Why are we saying this word instead of this word? You know, those are really, really important things to consider. You also have to consider too, when you're asking for these step-by-step -step instructions on how to do something is, do these steps even fit your beliefs? A lot of rituals that I see online um, are very Wicca focused, right? They cast a circle, they call the quarters and call in the elements and uh, do everything like that. Those wouldn't be good for me because I don't care about any of that. I don't cast a circle. I don't call the quarters. I have my own method of protection. I have my own invocation that I use. All of these match my beliefs and my particular practice. 
If you're using someone else's rituals or you're asking for step-by-step -step instruction on how to do this, then you may not fully examine your own beliefs and you might end up doing something for so long that you're just like, do I actually believe this? Is this actually the way that I want to practice? And taking the time to figure out your own rituals or your own step-by-step -step instructions for whatever it is you're doing will help you figure out exactly what you believe. Because if you believe that casting a circle is necessary anytime you are doing a spell or a ritual, then obviously you're gonna want to include casting a circle in your instructions, right? But if you don't, then you're not gonna wanna include that. But if you don't believe casting a circle is important for your rituals or your spells, then you're not going to do that. And taking the time, to figure all of that out. What is my protection? What, what am I trying to do? Why do I need these instructions? Is really gonna help you grow and learn to think critically about all of the steps you're taking, all of the tools that you're using, and why you're doing things the way you are. I think it's really important to understand how to substitute ingredients and tools in spells and rituals if you're using someone else's framework, right? Taking a ritual, for example, taking, let's go with a spell, taking a spell from the internet, printing it out, getting all of these ingredients, following the steps exactly, and connecting with this ritual shows that you know how to follow directions. Unless you connect with that ritual on a deep level and it exactly matches what you need, it might not be enough for you. And I'm of the opinion that you don't need to go out and buy all of these herbs that you're never going to use except for maybe once or twice when you could learn how to substitute different things in your practice. I think being able to make your own substitutions based on your own beliefs and your own practices is one of the markers of someone who's really in touch with their practice. And learning how to make those substitutions comes from your critical thinking skills. It comes from your ability to analyze why you're using a specific item. It comes from your ability to understand, you know, the history of that item's uses and its magical and medicinal properties and, you know, how it can be applied today. Being able to pick those things out and then put in your own um, substitution is a really good exercise of those critical thinking skills. So practice that. Create your own spells. Go on the internet and find some random spell, figure out the purpose of the spell, and then substitute your own ingredients. Go through your kitchen cabinet, your spice rack or whatever, and pull out a random ingredient and research it, figure out what it's used for, or hold it in your hands and close your eyes and connect with it on an energetic level and speak with it, connect with it intuitively and see what that particular spice or plant has to share with you. Part of the reason I don't share a lot of um, like spell walkthroughs and DIYs and stuff is because of this particular issue that I have encountered way too many times online. I have uh, shown how to do different protection spells and an apple love spell. And the amount of questions that I've gotten that seem completely thoughtless is just ridiculous. And even the amount of comments that I have gotten, um, I'm thinking of one video in particular where I did a protection spell. I charmed a necklace for my child for protection and I used a very personal protection herbal blend, right? And I said that in the video, this is my personal blend that I use for protection. Feel free to substitute your own, um, but I will not be sharing the herbs that I have used in this spell. Next, we're going to light our charcoal disc to burn the loose herbs. This blend of herbs is a special one of mine, and I encourage you to create your own blend of protection herbs because I'm not going to tell you what's in mine. And I got at least one person who was really freaking mad at me that I didn't share the herbs that I used. But like, why do I need to do that? I told you what it's for, and you know, now you can substitute your own. If you don't know other herbs that are used for protection, then it's time to put on your critical thinking hat, like put on your thinking cap, like they used to say in school, and do some research, reach out to some friends if you have to, to help push you in the right direction to figure out what herbs you have 
that can be used for protection. I don't want to be the kind of person that just creates spells online for anybody to use that don't involve them also thinking for themselves and understanding why certain things are used. Like that's just not the kind of person that I wanna be here on YouTube. That's not the purpose of my channel and what I do. Using your critical thinking skills is also extremely important when it comes to researching mythology and history in general. And this might not apply to everyone, not everyone is a pagan, but I think having those critical thinking skills when analyzing information that you're reading or consuming in any matter is a, a vital skill to have. When you use your critical thinking skills in regard to mythology and research, for example, those skills are gonna be able to help you tell a good source of information from a bad source of information. And I will be the first to tell you that there's a lot of really crappy information out there on the internet and written in books. And coming from my perspective, I am a Celtic pagan and I mainly focus on Irish mythology. The Irish gods are the gods that I have a connection with currently. So I'm gonna come from that perspective. But in Irish mythology, everything is complicated and you don't necessarily have one right answer. It's gonna depend on where the story is coming from, who told the story, and when it was written down. My ability to think critically about some of the stories that I read helps me understand what I'm reading better. Knowing the current culture of Ireland as best I can as an American, knowing Irish history as best I can, and being able to understand that not everything is as simple as it may appear when you're first reading something. For example, we'll talk about the Tan Bokunya. For the life of me right now, I can't remember what the translation to that is in English. I will put it up here on the video for you. But the Tan Bokunya in mythology is about the, the theft of a prized bull, right? And it starts with two people, husband and wife, king and queen, laying in bed and, you know, bantering back and forth. And the even the beginning is called pillow talk, right? They're having sort of an argument about wealth. And they're, they're going back and forth and they're talking. And anybody that would look at that without cultural context would think like, why why is she getting mad that he's saying he has more wealth or why is she getting upset that she has one less um one less bull than her husband right anybody from the outside would see this as a pissing contest between husband and wife to see who was richer right but that's not what it was at all it was kind of like a power struggle because cattle were extremely important in ancient Ireland. That was wealth, that was power, and the more cattle you had, the more powerful and wealthy you appeared. So it was extremely important for the wife in this story, I believe it was Maeve, I could be remembering this wrong, to at least be on par with her husband and not be less than him. So without being able to think critically about the story, that entire like power struggle and reason for this entire story, this entire battle that involved like so many people and Cúchulainn and Ulster and yeah, all of it. What It would have gone right over my head because I was only reading the words on the page and not thinking about what they meant. It's also really important to remember that just because it's written in a book or online or because somebody says it doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it safe either. I wanna share a story about this where people tend to let their critical thinking skills go out the window and it's it involves health. I don't blame people for putting their trust in others who might have more knowledge than they do when it comes to their health. I used to work at a health food store, oh gosh, um, a long time ago. Half the reason people would come into that store is because the vitamins and supplements section was huge. They sold a product there that could kill you if you ate too many of them. But this product was, was praised as a way to naturally beat your cancer. And it's apricot kernels. Apricot kernels, that's it. And nobody would think twice about it. Eat the apricot kernels, they're natural, right? 
they have to be good for you. And if, if people think that it can cure your cancer, great, but what's the harm if it doesn't? The problem with this is that no one, well, I can't say no one, it was on the bag, but my problem with this and the experience that I had is many people that I spoke to about these apricot kernels had no idea that eating too many could literally kill you. And the reason for this is that apricot kernels contain a chemical. I can't remember what the chemical is called right now, but apricot kernels contain a chemical that your body metabolizes into cyanide. So quite literally, eating too many apricot kernels will give you cyanide poisoning and will kill you. But it's natural, right? It's natural, so it must be safe. People are doing it to cure their cancer, so it must be safe. Now, obviously, we know that chemo is the current treatment for cancer, and that's definitely not safe either. It's also literally poison. But that is generally done under the supervision of professionals. It really bothers me that there are people out there that take advantage of others who are in unfortunate situations, who are just looking for help. They're just looking for an alternative, something to make them feel better. And then they do this, and they say, here you go, have some apricot kernels. Just only eat two uh, once a week, otherwise you'll die. That translates over into spells and rituals. And it's really strange that it does that because you would think that people that are going into witchcraft and paganism or alternative spiritualities would be able to think critically about what it is that they're doing. And don't get me wrong, the majority of people can. The majority of people would look at what I'm about to say next and go, no, you're, you're crazy. What are you doing? Like, we're not gonna do that. But there are some people out there who, once they're put in front of someone who is in a perceived position of authority or someone who actually has authority, they, they like put all of their trust in this person and they lose their ability to think for themselves. It's really scary how this can happen. And yeah, it translates over into witchcraft, paganism, new age, spiritualism, all of it. There was a long, it was a long time ago, but I used to browse this website called Spells of Magic, right? And it's still around, It's it's been around for a really long time. But I distinctly remember seeing a spell on there for how to change your eye color and First, physically, like to physically change the color of your eyes is impossible. You can do glamour magic to change the color of your eyes uh, as far as like people perceive them, but you can't physically change the color of your eyes. Anyway, this spell was telling people to choose a candle of the color that they wanted their eyes to be, light it, and drip wax into their eyes to change the color of their eyes. And I don't know how many people did it. I don't know if anybody did actually do this. Hopefully not. But just the fact that someone would take advantage of another person's trust in this way just really, really pisses me off. Critical thinking is also going to be an extremely important skill to have if and when you get involved with spirits and deities. Depending on your tradition and your beliefs, there are spirits and deities out there who will try to trick you or who can pretend to be someone that they're not, right? Not every tradition or belief system has this. Um, some people believe that spirits can't lie. Other people believe that spirits can definitely lie and they do it just for the hell of it, right? So that's gonna be like something that you have to contend with in your own belief system. Knowing how to think critically about what it is that you're experiencing will help you in so many different situations. It can help keep you from getting involved in something that you're not ready for. It can help keep you from getting tricked by a spirit who just wants to take advantage of you. You know, there are so many different times that critical thinking is important. And a question that I've seen recently was someone asking, they were asking about an offering substitution for Hecate because they only had white, white wine instead of red wine, I believe it was, and they wanted to know if white wine would be a good alternative to give an offering to Hecate. My first response is, why don't you ask? If you're really concerned about it, do some divination or go into a meditative trance or whatever, however this person communicates with their deity, and ask. The second piece of advice that I gave to this person is, unless explicitly stated not to, then it should be fine. I don't personally work 
with Hecate. So I can't say what would be a good offering for her versus what wouldn't. But what I can say is that there are many different ways that the answer can be found. You can ask her, you can read her stories, you can search for anecdotal information online from other people who also work with Hecate. So learning how to think critically about these situations can help prevent you from having to wait for someone else to answer the question for you. Going out and searching for these answers and thinking about what it is that you're doing also helps you grow in your own practice. So an example from my own personal practice, I work with Bridget. Bridget is heavily connected to dairy and cattle, right? I don't offer Bridget milk or butter because I'm plant-based. I eat a mostly plant-based diet, and so the milk and butter that I have, I have almond milk and I have plant-based butter. And neither one of those things have any dairy in it. So for me, I wouldn't offer that to Bridget because I've, like, she's really connected to the butter and dairy and cream and stuff. And I feel like offering a plant-based substitute would probably not go over very well. Like, that's just the feeling I get. I, I can see, like, in my mind, me offering this, like, little cup of plant butter to her and her being like, what the heck is that? That's not butter, you know? So for me, thinking critically about the connections that Bridget has and her stories and my own personal experience with her gives me the UPG that I don't offer Bridget anything plant-based that is supposed to imitate something made from dairy. I hope that all makes sense about like connecting your critical thinking with the questions that you're asking and how all of that can work together. So before we go, I just want to say that if this video triggers you in any specific way, I ask that you kindly sit with that for a little bit to figure out maybe why you feel triggered because this video is not an attack on anyone and I don't want it to come across that way and I really want this to be like advice for bettering yourself in your practice and how you connect with the world around you, your gods, your magic, and the spells and stuff that you do. This video is not a judgment. This video is not a criticism. I don't want anybody to think that they can't ask questions either. You would not believe the amount of questions I get both in my job and being here as a creator on YouTube and Instagram and stuff. And a lot of the questions that I get are questions that can be answered with like a simple Google search. Or if the person asking the question just sat back and thought about it for themselves for a minute. I'm okay with questions. I'm okay with answering them, I'm okay with pointing you in the right direction, but I really encourage anybody that's asking anybody a question to approach it yourself first if possible because that's where the growth is gonna happen. That's where you're going to learn how to reach out and ask for help if you can't figure it out. That's where you're going to get the confidence that you need because, hey, you found the answer, right? But it's also where you're gonna get the humility to realize that you don't know everything and that's okay. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it's thought provoking. I hope I didn't piss anybody off. <laughs> oh my goodness, that's like, I'm terrified of making anybody angry. Um, I hope everybody understands that it's not a judgment on anyone's practice or anybody asking questions and it's not meant to reflect back on anyone that has limitations or a disability or something that prevents them from thinking critically in certain situations or in all situations. I understand that everyone works differently and everyone's brain is different. So yes, critical thinking, thinktober. I will link the hashtag in the description below and tag everybody that is also participating in this collaboration. Again, I hope you enjoyed the video and got something from it. If you have any advice that you'd like to share with, with myself or with anybody else that goes through and reads the comments, please feel free to leave a comment in the comments below with your advice. 
If you're going to leave a comment and you're gonna disagree with me, that's great, that's perfect. I only ask that you do it kindly and in a civil manner because we're all here to learn. I make mistakes and sometimes I may come across one way when I don't mean to. I have an extreme fear of being misunderstood and I tend to over explain a lot of stuff and overshare a lot of stuff because of my neurodivergencies. But yes, if you're going to disagree with me, that's totally fine. I just ask that you are kind with your comments and we can have a civil discussion. If you are unkind, you will be blocked. I don't play around. I don't have time for hate. I don't have time for trolls. If you want to have a discussion, cool. Let's have a discussion. Anyway, yes, check out my forum, follow me on social media. All of those links are in the description below. And until next time, I will see you later. Bye.